Hello and welcome to another scintillating and commiserating episode of What Happened, the show where you say, why was it like that? To which we say, it sometimes be like that. Today we are tackling one of those lost children that fell through the cracks and died horribly during the leap to 3D gaming. Among the dozens of bodies that litter these killing fields, you'll find your Bubsbees, your Belmonts, and your Contrasuses, but only in the deepest, darkest pit would you find the burnt out husk of the super suit belonging to Earthworm Jim? He's probably one of the greatest casualties during this paradigm. Ch Is that the term? Paradigm? Paradigm shift? How about revolution? Paradigm shift? That sounds better. Okay. Paradigm shift from 2D to 3D platforming. There's plenty to unpack here. How could Earthworm Jim, a series that seemingly had such a bright future, what with two successful entries, a Saturday morning cartoon show, and even a line of action figures shrivel up and die so quickly? Well, it's time to find out what happened. This sequel that you might have rented but were definitely disappointed by started off very differently during its early phase of development, and there's quite a tale on how it all went so sour. Following the completion of Earthworm Jim 2, the competent but somehow still less memorable sequel, Shiny Entertainment, the original developer, and more specifically its CEO, Dave Perry, found himself being courted by the likes of Sony and Nintendo to develop exclusively for their new machines. Rebuffing those offers, he decided to accept a buyout from Interplay while still managing to keep Shiny's name and autonomy and allowing them to make what they want. Another mandate that Perry instituted was that they would have a strict no sequels policy as Shiny wanted to surprise players with every game, regardless if their titles were successful enough to warrant it. They then developed MDK and Wild 9 for the PlayStation, which, while certainly solid titles, didn't manage to capture the magic of the tiny earthworm that was blessed with the power of a thousand Jesuses. Dave Perry did one more thing that was uh, very unusual. Figuring that Shiny didn't need the Earthworm Jim IP to succeed and wanting to focus on the future, sold the rights to the franchise to Interplay as a pot sweetening bonus, a um, move that he admits was somewhat regrettable. Selling the rights to Earthworm Jim to Interplay was the dumbest move of my career, he lamented in an interview with Kikizio. Well, that'll learn ya. And that's saying a lot, cause this is the same guy that launched Gakai? I have no memory of this place. This deal with Interplay is why you saw Jim pop up in the critically lauded and respected Evo main stage attraction, Clay Fighter 63 and a third. <laughs> But with Shiny now refusing to take on sequels and the sales from Jim 1 and 2 irresistible to capitalize on, Interplay were looking to drag the Earthworm into the third dimension. Whether he wants to or not. Enter Vis Interactive, a Scotland-based studio which only had one title to their credit, Heads for the PC, which I personally call out anybody to actually remember. Information here gets a bit murky, but I was able to speak to a developer who worked on Earthworm Jim 3D who can give some insight into how things got so very what happened-y. Vis Interactive were a very young company, were ran by a persuasive character by the name of Chris Vander Cool. The fact that Vis ended up with the license is down to his charm, I'd say. And when I joined, there were only a very small number of staff with any real experience making games. For most folk, like myself, this was the first big project we had worked on. There was a lot of inexperience, and I couldn't believe we were making an Earthworm Jim title, to be honest. Now, remember two minutes ago when I I said the version of Earthworm Jim 3D you or a very very few of you actually played started off quite differently? Well, it's time to dissect that particular worm. The canon version of the game that was sold in stores saw Jim minding his own business before a cow comes careening down on top of him as they do, which proceeded to scramble Jim's four brains, a joke the games never really touched upon but the cartoon series certainly did. Brain free! 
Please! Jim then had to splunk deep into the depths of his own mines, needing to unlock each one by collecting golden udders, which are legally distinct, the best type of distinct, when compared to power stars or jiggy pieces. When the developer I spoke to first got hired by this and was assigned to Jim 3D, it was already in production, but all the setup that I just set up, well, it wasn't the original vision. When I started, Earthrealm Gym 3D was actually pretty good and original, which maybe explains why Interplay were confident in the product during those early days. It was PC only, and was sort of an open world which I thought felt fresh. There was a cowboy Wild West level where you could run around and go into saloons, there was even a tornado which you could climb inside while riding on pianos and furniture. It was a bit rough, but there was just something about it. So, you can clearly see there is some disparity between that and the boxed finished game. Platformers were going through a revolution, a paradigm shift during the tail end of the 90s, owing a lot to Rare and Nintendo's efforts in the genre. The N64 was home to a glut of bouncy, colorful goodness and collectathons, and by 1999, the PlayStation had also accrued its own fair share of what the British like to call Jumpin' Boppus. So, the minds at Interplay and Viz felt that making a PC-only platformer for such a well-established character was kind of silly, and then proceeded to make bad, hastily made decisions. As production went on though, the design of Jim 3D began to get influenced by games like Banjo-Kazooie, which were miles ahead of where we were. It was a problem Viz had in general, being knocked off course design-wise. I think if they'd stuck with their original instincts, the final game might have turned out to be quite Quite interesting. Now, when you're already deep in production, it's never a great idea to slam on the brakes and start doing something completely different, but there is of course precedent for that working out. Famously, Remedy Entertainment took a fully complete open world map, realized it wasn't quite working, and changed it to a linear level based structure for Alan Wake. But um, this was Earthworm Jim 3D, and this is second game ever. It takes a lot of experience and technology technical know-how to repurpose assets and levels for such a switch, and this was just too inexperienced to make it work. You let me down, man. Now, going back to those hastily made decisions, Interplay then mandated that N64 and PlayStation ports needed to accompany the PC version, and instead of doing the, uh, normal thing, which is to hire another studio to make said ports, they assigned this to make them as well. Now, remember Heads? Of course you don't, but like previously stated, it was the developer's only other game, and it was a PC exclusive. This had never worked on the N64 or PlayStation prior to this, and man, I, I smell the same stinky aura which permeated Bubsy 3D's developmental slaughtering grounds. What really killed things was when development shifted from just focusing on a PC version to making N64 and PS1 ports concurrently. We just didn't have the capacity, and the hardware limitations of the PlayStation in particular meant most of the open world levels were scaled back, and as time passed, a lot more features were cut. During this really temperamental time, Shiny staff, including Dave Perry, visited the studio to see what Viz was up to, and, uh, like the professionals they were, reportedly made it very visible they were displeased. Well, maybe you should have thought of that before you implemented a <coughs> absolutely no- <coughs> sequels policy, Dave! While Shiny undoubtedly had their own project at the time, maybe instead of just having a moan, why not give this some constructive feedback or maybe loan out a member of their staff to guide the project a little more closely than not at all? That might have helped a bit more than, you know, just being salty. What, is that it? That doesn't, how's that? Come on, like... Oh, shit! I need better salt than that! Regardless, delays dragged on and on, and more and more levels and characters wound up being cut, and this includes the infamous final packaging of Jim 3D. The box and associated screenshots show Evil the Cat as an end boss, but is replaced in-game by Professor Monkey for a head. It also showed a level in a house, pocket rocket racing, and a snowboard level, all things that were not present in the finished game. Then, in mid 
1999 after four years of development and with the game still being technically shaky, Earthworm Jim 3D had to emerge from the soil. Interplay was one of those publishers that were massive back in the 16-bit era but struggled to find a lot of big hits as the new millennium approached and they really needed a hit. But since they didn't have one, they decided to release Earthworm Jim 3D. There was one final crisis when Interplay realized what a steaming pile they had on their hands. I don't think they had been paying any attention to the development at all because they had a terrible producer. There was a massive amount of crunch leading up to launch and by the end of the project, it was a shell of what we had started with. The game released on Halloween 1999 in North America and it was it was up against some stiff competition that month. Jet Force Gemini, Rayman 2, and Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage were all clustered around the quivering earthworm and hell, Sonic Adventure had just debuted the previous month so a platforming space was cutthroat and the only thing that set Jim 3D apart was how poorly it reviewed. The kindest critique simply called the game boring and mediocre, with the not-so-kindest echoing statements like in GameSpot's official review, which focused a lot on the sometimes uncooperative camera. The camera in Earthworm Jim 3D is on a kamikaze mission to destroy the game. Next Generation Magazine gave the game a single star out of five, stating, At some point, you wind up asking yourself, who in their right mind would think this was fun? The PC version which arrived a few months later was actually reviewed even more harshly, with GameSpot again dropping some super hot fire like Earthworm Jim 3D has something to discourage all types of people from playing it. Fans of the series will be disappointed by the lackluster translation of the characters into three dimensions and everyone else will be frustrated by the horrible camera. This game seemingly ended Jim's whole career. After the fallout and a few short years later, Dave Perry, realizing his mistake after having fallen on hard times when titles like Messiah and Sacrifice, a game I didn't even know existed, wanted the Jim franchise back. Fortunately, in one of those twists of fate we're so accustomed to, Atari, previously Infogrames, wound up buying several properties from Interplay in 2001, leading to a happy coincidence, Earthworm Jim was now their IP. I said to the CEO of Atari, if I rebuild the Earthworm Jim team, will you fund it? And he said he would. So we rebuilt the team. When I came back to them, Atari said they were low on cash and they weren't going to start any new projects. It was pretty embarrassing for me. Good old Dave would finally leave Shiny Entertainment just as it merged with The Collective to become Double Helix and went on to doing, um, Gakai. And then that's pretty much it. As far back as 2012, he claimed he had been making a new Earthworm Jim title, but shockingly, it hasn't materialized. Eat something, you bad fish! This, I'm sure they must have closed down after Earthworm Jim 3D Interactive, didn't close down. In fact, they went on to make State of Emergency for Rockstar Games, Evil Dead Fistful of Boomstick for THQ, NARC for Midway, and returned to 3D platformers with the often forgotten but surprisingly solid Brave in 2005. They were sold to BAM Entertainment later that year, but unfortunately were shut down in 2007, technically outlasting shiny entertainment by a year. Thus ends the ballad of the spacefaring superhero's video game career, at least for now. There were a few HD ports scattered about, some cancelled titles here and there, and there was some type of announcement of a brand new gym title coming exclusively to the Intellivision Amico. Amico? But, oh lord, I, I need a break and a lot of strength before I talk about that. If you know of any other floppy video game or movie foibles, shout it out in the comments below or inch your way to the Patreon to nominate the subject of a future episode. See you next time, you pulsating, bloated, festering, sweaty, pus-filled, malformed slug for a butts, and thanks for watching.